Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A couple of last stragglers coming in, so uh, welcome. I am Dr. John Spencer. I am the interim director of the Walter and Mary Tui Chair of Interreligious Studies and a member of the Department of Theology and Religious Studies here at John Carroll University. On behalf of the university and the TUI chair, I want to welcome you this evening and introduce our speaker in the speaker series. The lecture series, Buddhist Ideals of Human Flourishing, Beauty, Love, and Happiness in Ancient Theravada Buddhism, is this spring's edition of the Walter and Mary TUI Lectures in Interreligious Studies. These lectures are supported by funds provided by Walter and Mary Tui. Mr. Tui was the chief executive officer of the Baltimore, excuse me, Chesapeake and Ohio Railway, the CNO. Given his interest in interreligious studies, he and his wife established this endowed chair in 1966. This makes the Tui chair nearly 50 years old, and thus one of the oldest chairs in ecumenical studies at an American university. We here at John Carroll University are very grateful to Walter and Mary Tui for their generosity and very honored to carry on the practice of engaging different religious traditions through thoughtful, intellectual, and respectful conversation. This evening's lecture will continue that practice. Our lecturer this evening and for the next two nights is Dr. Maria Heim. Dr. Heim is Associate Professor of Buddhist Studies in the Department of Religion at Amherst College. Dr. Heim began her academic career at Reed College where she graduated Phi Beta Kappa with a BA in Interdisciplinary Philosophy and Religion. From there she went to Harvard University where she received a PhD from the Department of Sanskrit and Indian Studies. Her dissertation was titled The Ethics of the Gift, a Study of Medieval South Asian Discourses on Dana. After her doctoral studies, Dr. Heim taught for several years at California State University in Long Beach before moving in 2003 to her current position at Amherst College. She's received a number of prestigious awards and fellowships, including one from the Guggenheim Foundation, a Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship, a Fulbright Grant, and a fellowship to the American Institute for Sri Lankan Studies she has held a number of important positions on boards and committees, including the Buddhist session of the American Academy of Religion and the American Institute of Sri Lankan Studies. She's also associate editor of the Journal of Religious Ethics and recently finished a term as chair of the Religion Department at Amherst. As a former chair, I congratulate her on surviving that. <laughs> Dr. Heim has an extensive list of publications. Her most recent book is Forerunner of All Things, The Buddha Gosa on Mind, Intention, and Agency with Oxford University Press. Her articles have a wide range of focuses from Buddhist ethics published in the Journal of Religious Ethics to the concept of self-loathing in the Journal of Indian Philosophy to the aesthetics of excess in the Journal of American Academy of Religion. She has had an active speaking schedule with lectures in such diverse places as the Buddhist Society of London, Stanford University, University of Pennsylvania, Indiana University, University of California at Berkeley, uh, universities in Japan, and in Malaysia. While she was through this area before, when her sister was studying at Oberlin, this is her first formal visit to Cle Cleveland. And giving her a brief tour of the downtown this afternoon, I discovered that she's intrigued by the architecture of our area. So we're very privileged to have Dr. Heim with us this spring, and I'm anticipating a series of very interesting and informative lectures. As one who reads ancient texts, I am particularly interested in the lecture this evening, which is titled, The Beauty and Pleasure of Ancient Texts. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Maria Heim. Thank you very much for such a kind and 
gracious introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here. I've um, just got into Cleveland today, but I've really enjoyed my stay already in what is really a very beautiful city. Um, and it is a great honor and privilege and a treat for me to join this long-standing conversation and dialogue and interreligious understanding that was initiated by Walter and Mary Tuhi. Um, so I might just introduce you to uh, some of the, the big themes I'm interested in in, the, in these three lectures. Um, first, just what I'm mostly going to talk about this evening um, is I'm interested in learning how to read texts from the ancient past um, to open up the worlds of imagination and possibilities for thought that such texts provide. And I see this as not something that's a given, but a disciplinary effort in the sense of, of trying to understand the practices of training that are required to gain access to their worlds. Now here I, I don't mean specifically academic disciplines such as philology or history and so on, though these are not precluded and actually are required for the kind of disciplining with texts that I'm interested in, but I'm also interested in what ancient thinkers thought we needed to know in order to understand their texts and the disciplinary strategies they considered important in the acquisition of knowledge and in the education of the imagination. And I think some of this will be specific to particular traditions, so what I offer tonight is an investigation into some of the intellectual values of pre-modern Theravada Buddhist worlds. I'm also interested in aesthetics, emotion, moral psychology, different modes of experience that ancient texts allow us to think about and perhaps even generate. And I will be talking about these more concretely on, on the basis of the foundation I lay out here tonight and in the next two lectures tomorrow on love and then happiness on Tuesday. So that these two interests are closely related. First of all, how is it that we, in a time and place far removed from the worlds of ancient texts, can come, not just, can come to not just understand what they say, but to begin to understand, interpret, and perhaps even to feel some of the sensibilities and ways of knowing that they describe, and I'll get closer to the microphone at this point. <laughs> okay. Um, so, the ancient texts I will be focusing on are centered in the Theravada Buddhist tradition, both canonical scripture, but particularly tonight and tomorrow night, on the work of an important commentator on these texts named Buddhaghosa. He lived in the 5th century, wrote in the intellectual and scriptural language of Pali, and was a monumental figure in this particular branch of Buddhism that has a long history, but today is present in Sri Lanka, mainland Southeast Asia, and increasingly globally. So here's just a little map of, you can see Buddhism radiating out from North India, starting around the 5th century BCE, at the time of the Buddha, spreading out through the rest of Asia, and I'm speaking tonight of the Buddhism that today is located here in uh, Sri Lanka and then most of mainland Southeast Asia. Long history of how it came, this particular branch of Buddhism came to be established in this part of the world. Okay, before I begin with uh, Buddhaghosa, however, I want to start with a thinker from a very different context, a modern scholar named Pierre Ado, who died a few years ago, who has been very helpful for me to think about what I'm trying to do with texts. Ado was a French scholar of ancient Western philosophy, particularly the Stoic tradition. What I admire about him is his sensitivity to the question of how ancient texts might be read beyond their historical contexts, so that they might somehow speak to us. In his book, The Present Alone is Our Happiness, he describes an approach to reading texts that entails striving to meet, as he puts it, two equally urgent contrary requirements. The first is the requirement to aim for the ideal of objectivity and impartiality, which entails what he called a rigorous exercise of self-detachment required to avoid distortion and anachronism. All too easily, we want to read our concerns back into the past. So this involves learning how to read ancient texts by interpreting them within the discursive context, context through which they make meaning, as well as situating them within the social, historical, and material conditions from which they emerged and to which they spoke. This will take close philological and historical work and care and attention to the form and content of a work in which, to whatever degree possible, we can come close to discerning the intention or sense of the author in Ado's view. At the same time, Ado argues that this striving for objectivity 
makes possible an equally important movement in which the interpreter is, as he put it, in a certain sense implicated in the interpretation. Now, here's his words. If one tries to understand a text properly, I believe that afterward one can be brought, almost spontaneously, to discover its human meaning, that is, to situate it in relation to the general problem of humanity, of the human, even if it's not edifying at all. Thus, one can do basically as the Stoics did concerning their representations. First, begin with an adequate and objective judgment. This is what is said. Then, eventually, make a judgment of value. This has given significance for my life. This time, he says, one can speak of a return to subjectivity, a subjectivity that incidentally, incidentally attempts to elevate itself to a universal perspective. So Ado argues that working for the objective meaning of the text, what it meant in its context, as he sees it, becomes a condition for another movement towards discovering subjective meaning in it, of how it might speak to me in my context about being in my concerns about being human. Um, so in, importantly, the, the subjective here leads outside of the self to the human in a more general sense. This latter sense, what Ado calls the actual sense of a text, is premised on the ideas that on the idea that explorations of the past can have a personal, formative, and existential sense. This sense is not identical to the author's meaning. In fact, the meaning intended by the ancient author is never actual. It is ancient, and that is all there is to it. But it can take on an actual significance for us to the extent that it can appear to us, for example, as the source of certain actual ideas, or especially because it can inspire an actual attitude in us, an inner act or spiritual exercise. Now, this idea of spiritual exercise was an important part of Ado's thought, what he took to be the nature of ancient philosophy, which was originally practiced, he argues, as a way of life. When a text becomes the source of certain actual ideas, which may have not been anticipated by the author, but what are yet made poss possible for by the text, we are poised to explore new truths and understandings that might, if they don't have universal, they might have at least right, wide-ranging significance. So my question from this, at its most basic, could be stated, what must I do to allow myself to be addressed by a text? And my idea is that the texts themselves often tell us what we must do. Okay, now in my field, probably um, the most common way that scholars treat texts from India or early Buddhism is to see them simply in terms of intellectual history, insofar as they help us see a history of ideas or social, cultural, pol uh, or, or political life, largely something belonging to and contained within its past, but not necessarily reaching outside of their historical moment and addressing us. But in what I will call a humanistic reading of the sort that I think Ado is suggesting, a careful historicist interpretation is the prior move that can make possible the text also addressing us. Now, I don't mean here converting us religiously, but simply addressing us as human beings, whatever forms that might take existentially, philosophically, morally, aesthetically. Now, from within a religious perspective, people, of course, will be already be committed to the idea that a religious text from their tradition no matter how ancient, will potentially have meaning and significance for them. Christians today turn to the Bible expecting it to address them, even though they are not first century Corinthians or Romans. Um, Buddhists too would read, might read their texts expecting them to address them. But what about someone without such, a give, with such pre given commitments who encounters a text from another tradition? All of us committed to interreligious understanding want to understand and perhaps even be addressed, at least in this humanistic way by texts from other traditions. What Ado articulates is how we might do so. What are the conditions, the scholarly disciplines and practices that can make being addressed possible? With these concerns, Ado was naturally quite interested in the question of reading and interpretation. He suggests that one cannot read an, an ancient author the way one does a contemporary author. We cannot understand meaning without appreciating the rules, the forms, the models of discourse of a text. He argues that in studying an ancient text, we must take into account all the constraints that weighed upon them, which included literary genres, rhetorical rules, dogmatic imperatives, and traditional modes of reasoning. What were their theories of texts? How did they understand genre, since considerations of genre will be the guide for studying 
the modes of knowledge they both make possible and constrain. Reading a Stoic text might be quite different from the traditional genres of Buddhist texts. Buddhist texts may offer genres that we don't understand yet very well or have any analog elsewhere. We therefore need to be attentive to what textual traditions might say about how their text should be read. Now turning back to Buddhaghosa um, and the text I work on, I note the value of Ado's interest in genre and rules of discourse in coming to appreciate what Buddhaghosa can teach us. I find him, as a commentator, remarkably explicit about how to read and interpret texts, although scholars have not much appreciated this particular aspect of his thought. He has a theory of texts, in particular of the Buddha's words, and very specific guidelines about how to read and interpret them. It is these guidelines I am calling disciplinary strategies or practices that I want to focus on tonight, because I think he offers us something relatively rare, an exploration of the aesthetic dimensions of intellectual rigor. He is deeply interested in the beauty and pleasure of intellectual practice and tries to communicate how it might work. In this, he offers a rather complex set of practices for receiving the Buddha's words. Of course, he doesn't make the move ultimately that I want to make from this, which is to extrapolate some of his ideas about encountering the Buddha's words into suggesting ways to engage humanistically across traditions. He certainly did not anticipate the development of the humanities and the liberal arts tradition or dialogues of interreligious understanding, like this one, um, that were created within the Western Academy um, and in, in the context in which I work. Um, but he does lay the groundwork for thinking about how the aesthetic can mediate our encounter with ancient texts in a way that might be usefully applied in considering what I'm going to talk about in my next two lectures, Buddhist ideas of love tomorrow and happiness on Tuesday. All right. So, Doctor, can you slow down your speaking a little bit? Okay, sure. Thank you much. So, Buddhaghosa lived about a, a thousand years after the Buddha. He was thus at some remove in time from the Buddha, and he's about 1,500 years uh, separate from us. There are ways in which he's looking both back at the Buddha and deeply interested in the context in which the scriptures first emerged, um, although his approach to approach to text is not at all historicist um, in any way like modern historical criticism. But he's also looking forward in time towards us in the sense that he sees himself as a custodian of the text that he's preserving and he's trying to make it possible for them to be received in the future. Much of what he has to say about interpretation concerns uh, looking both of these directions of vision, looking back into the past and looking forward uh, into the future. Now, we have very little his historical record about Buddhaghosa. The legends about him tell us um, just what the tradition thought was important about him. They describe Buddhaghosa as a Brahmin and a great debater who promised to follow the teachings of anyone who could best him in debate uh, in a complex and very interesting philosophical milieu in India in the 5th century. After a long time in which no one was able to meet that challenge, he encountered a Buddhist monk who was trained in a philosophical system of a genre of text called the Abhidhamma, which is one of the three collections of the Buddhist canonical sources. Having presented, been presented with a system of knowledge he could not refute, he decided to become a Buddhist monk so that he could learn it, um, this particular system of thought. So he comes to the whole thing as an intellectual, driven by scholarly curiosity. Then, according to these legends, once he mastered the teachings, he thereafter became a committed Buddhist. At which point, then, he is enjoined by his teachers in India to go to Sri Lanka and translate the commentaries there, which they say were in danger of being lost. So the commentaries, the ancient commentaries were, uh, at this point, preserved, at least for this branch of Buddhism, were preserved in ancient Sinhala. He's being asked to go to Sri Lanka and translate them into Pali, which is a translocal cosmopolitan language that would then, people outside of the Sinhalese speaking world would have access to them. Um, so he goes, we don't know exactly where he was from in India, but he does go to uh, Sri Lanka. Um, and he's, the various accounts of the different trials the Sri Lankan authorities put him under to see if he was worthy of this big project. But eventually he proved himself and came to be entrusted with an enormous project of editing and translating a huge corpus of work. 
um, and we no longer have those ancient Sinhala texts, so what we have of the commentarial tradition comes out of this moment of Buddhaghosa's work. Just as an aside, it's hard to convey just how prolific Buddhist thinkers have been throughout their long history. Um, we're dealing with that, taken as a whole, with one of the largest bodies of canonical and exegetical material from any religious tradition. Even just the Theravada corpus to which Buddhaghosa was entrusted is quite vast. Um, the Pali Canon is not one, but actually many volumes, um, over 30 volumes, just the, the canonical part of uh, the Pali tradition. Um, and the commentaries on those texts is yet that number again. Um, and we won't even get into describing the sub-commentaries and the compendia that these generated. Um, and I haven't even mentioned the Sanskrit or the Tibetan or the Chinese corpuses of texts, which are quite different but equally voluminous. So Buddhist studies is a matter of very few scholars spread thinly over very large scriptural and exegetical traditions. But what we think happened was that Buddhaghosa set up a workshop in Sri Lanka and probably working with a team of scholars translated and edited a very large body of material which was then preserved in Pali. He also wrote his own work, um, which is an important synopsis of the teachings called uh, the Vasudhi Maga or the Path of Purification. So this is supposed to be a sort of condensed summary of the canonical stuff, but still in English it's about 800 pages, so it's, a, it's still a pretty big summary. Okay, because of his deep involvement with textual study, um, it is not surprising that Buddhaghosa has things to say about what textual interpretation involved. One of the principal ways he's trying to understand and shape how the texts might be received in the future is to study how they were received in the past. His commentarial practice is chiefly concerned with expanding meaning, opening up what might be possible from a text. This is not an anything goes approach to interpretation where somebody could walk away with just any interpretation of a text. He's always ready to suggest what meanings are constrained by the text and the many ways a text could be misunderstood. However, at the same time, his ways of approaching a text are to make possible multiple ways of interpreting it, and he does so with an eye to the great range of human difference. So to give you an example of this, um, every Buddhist sutta, or sermon, begins with the phrase, thus have I heard. What this refers to is the way that the Buddha's words were recorded. The Buddha himself never wrote anything down, um, while the historical processes of canon formation are somewhat obscure to us, the traditional sources have a particular account of how they arrived at a canon. They record that after the Buddha died, his disciples held a big council, council where, they were, where, they tried, where they were resolved to recite and commit to memory everything they had heard him teach in his over 45 year long teaching career. One of their number, a disciple named Ananda, who was the Buddha's close attendant and had been by his side throughout his whole career, was known to have, be very learned, had a very good memory, and he was entrusted with reciting each sermon that he had heard. So he presided at the first council. Um, I don't know, I found some of these images on the web that just sounded like a good way to show who knows what it actually looked like. but. Um, to show you what that council might have looked like, although here it's in a cave. Um, in any case, Ananda was said to have recited at this first council, um, and when he recited each sermon, these were affirmed by the community as authentic and thereafter preserved as canonical. So each sermon opens with, thus have I heard, which is Ananda's way of reporting simply what he had heard. These teachings are usually situated by Ananda in a particular context. Thus have I heard, once upon a time, the Buddha was staying in Benares at such and such a time, and so and so asked him a question, and this is what he said. And then Ananda would relate the entire sermon. The, Thus I have heard is then an echo of this first council in Ananda's voice reciting the sermon. This phrase also has the effect that every time someone subsequently recites a Buddhist sermon or sutta, they echoed the statement of having heard it. I heard this from my own teacher in a long chain or oral recitation and transmission. It is worth pausing to note that even though I'm talking a lot about reading practices, much of the history of these sources involved oral recitation and encountering these texts through hearing them, 
but I don't think that makes a big difference for the points I want to make. Now, Buddhaghosa's commentary has a lot to say. He goes on for pages and pages about these four words, thus have I heard. And at first we might think that this is scholasticism, scholasticism run amok, but a closer inspection suggests that he's raising all sorts of interesting possibilities. The phrase supports Ananda's credibility. This is what I heard, I was there, in a way that Buddhaghosa says supports faith in, his, in Ananda's authority. It is also a disclaimer. Buddhaghosa says that Ananda is also saying that he is not the author of these words, just the transmitter of them, which promotes faith in a different way. Moreover, he says, when the words were first uttered by Ananda, all present applauded with a great sense of thrill, and they exclaimed, what was heard face to face when the Buddha was present can now be known even now that he is gone. This is what this phrase signals for present and future audiences too. Buddhaghosa then gets into some serious exegetical work on the phrase. He, the phrase, thus have I heard, is more accurately rendered, thus was heard by me, if we were to put it more accurately in the Pali. Um, and one example of the kind of work he is doing with this is that he considers different possibility of what was meant by th that by me. He says that by me in the instrumental it could be understood in the instrumental case, um, so that it would be, I heard this, right? I was there. Um, but it can also mean, and here the Pali is beautifully ambiguous, in the dative case, this text was spoken to me, um, as, the, as though the Buddha was speaking specifically to me. Later he sets this aside as a favored reading, but it's quite interesting that it's here, given that how much he has to say elsewhere, about the way that the Buddhist teachings seem to be geared specifically to their hearers, each in his or her own idiom and special circumstances. Also possible is that what it's uh, conveying, and again the Pali grammar makes this possible, is the genitive case. This was my hearing of the words. Others might have had a different hearing, but here is mine. Um, each of these has a slightly different uh, nuance. Now these options are left open. He doesn't ultimately decide any one of them. He wants all of them to be at play. Um, and so what I think might that be is that, Anna, that Buddhaghosa is trying to suggest that uh, the sermon might vary according to how it's heard in different contexts. Now Buddhaghosa also comments on what it is to hear something. He has a lot to say about what it means to hear, the, the verb hear. But then, he, and I'll leave that aside, but then he takes up the word thus um, which has several different senses, and one of this is the sense of aspects, right? So he has a long discussion of what thus means, and this is what he suggests. He says, who is able to understand in all its different modes the Bhagavan speech, Bhagavan is the word for the Buddha, um, which is skilled in various methods, originating from many dispositions of its audience, perfect in meaning and phrasing, possessing various marvels, profound in the penetrating teaching and meaning of the Dharma, and appropriate for all beings, and reaching the ears of each in their own languages. So what he's suggesting about this, I'll just show you how he parses it. He says, um, um, skilled in various methods, that what this is referring to is that the Buddha spoke in different registers or idioms, depending on the background and sophistication of its various audiences. Um, then he says that the Buddha's words emerge from various dispositions of the audience. And this is an idea that the Buddha's sermons were not premeditated deliveries. He never planned to say anything, but rather all of his utterances were made spontaneously to respond to the needs and dispositions of the people in front of him. And then he says the Buddha's words are perfect in meaning and letter. And this is a frequently encountered phrase that indicates the perfect match between form and, con and content. Fourth, they possess various marvels or miracles. Fifth, they are profound in the penetrating and teaching of the meaning of the Dharma, or the Dhamma, which are the teachings of the truth, as Buddhists see it. Sixth, they are appropriate for being for all beings, that is, that there's nobody who can't get something from them. And finally, interestingly, the Buddha's words reach each hearer in his or her own language. Like India today, ancient India would have been a complex multilingual environment,
And this is an idea that the Buddha would speak and each person present would hear it in the particular language he or she spoke. So this is the kind of work that Buddha Ghost is doing with each letter of, or each word in the small phrase. Um, I'm going to leave that commentary on thus have I heard now and look at some of the other features of Buddha's words as Buddhaghosa sees them because he suggests that knowing what kind of speech this is, if we know what the Buddha's speech is like, we can know what we might have to do to understand it. Now in another passage, we are told that the Buddha's words belong to the here and now, they're part of this visible world, but they are also simultaneously timeless. They invite introspection, but they also lead outward, and they are grasped by wise people individually. This last part is emphasized in several places. Learned people will understand the teachings in ways particular to them. People have singular needs and dispositions, and somehow the Buddha could address a large audience with one and the same sermon and yet be speaking singly, singly to each person in his or her own circumstances. Now there are further qualities that Buddhaghosa attributes to the Buddha's speech. He repeats a frequently encountered canonical phrase that the Buddha's speech is well said in the sense of being lovely in the beginning, lovely in the middle, and lovely at the end. It is completely perfect in meaning and letter, and it proclaims the pure holy life. One idea here is that the Buddha speech, that all speech has both meaning and letter, sense and form, if you will. Perfection and both qualities come together in what the Buddha said. In addition, the idea that the Buddha's words are lovely or beautiful, the word can also mean auspicious or good, and that they would need to be so in the beginning, middle, and end, opens up a lot of interpretive possibilities for the commentators. Buddhaghosa says that this will apply at every unit of text and at the levels of both letter and meaning. So every sentence or stanza is beautiful in the beginning, middle, and end. Every sequence of meaning within a sermon is lovely in these three places. The sermon as a whole, the book, and then the Dhamma or the teaching as a whole should be analyzed for its beauty in beginning, middle, and end. Now, to suggest that every sutra or sermon and every unit of text must be beautiful in each part is to develop a reading practice that attends to beauty and auspiciousness in each of its parts and in its total impression. It becomes a kind of device in which a commentator could examine the potential impact each part of a sermon might have on its audience. In other words, what are often taken to be simple and sort of general encomiums of the Buddhist speech and qualities, and we're used to in Buddhist text so many encomiums and praises of the Buddha, these might actually be in voicing deeper claims and commitments about reading and interpretive practice. Now a further claim that is worth looking at more closely is the frequency in which the commentators allege that the Buddha was omniscient and what this means for textual interpretation. The canonical sources themselves do not state that the Buddha was omniscient. This is a claim that comes from the commentarial tradition and it is one that they make much of. Um, so this claim of the Buddha's omniscience offers a number of epistemological and interpretive possibilities. But first, in what ways is the Buddha thought to be omniscient? According to Buddhaghosa, the Buddha is omniscient because he knows the Dharma, the teachings, the truth, the way things are as Buddhists understand it, and the Dharma itself is said to be endless or infinite. The Dharma is said to have infinite depth, and Buddhaghosa describes how after the Buddha's enlightenment, the Buddha set for the next seven days, plumbing the depths of the knowledge that he had discovered, and some of the texts say he grew exhausted by it. Um, in describing this, Buddhaghosa turns to metaphors of the ocean, which he sees as vast and even apparently endless. The Dharma is an ocean of knowledge that one cannot get to the end of. It is also an ocean of method. By ocean of method, uh, Buddhaghosa means specifically one branch of canonical Buddhist texts, which were called the Abhidhamma. And in fact, this is the same textual corpus that I referred to earlier that allegedly drew Buddhaghosa to Buddhism in the first place. This material was taught by the Buddha largely in the form 
of interpenetrating lists and matrices and groupings and regroupings of phenomena that provide a method for seeing the dynamic, interconnected, and intercausal nature of experience. It is the deepest core of the teachings, which is really a method for thought, a method for interpreting experience. Now, given this postulation of the Buddha's omniscience and the endlessness of the Dharma, Buddhaghosa considers a puzzle. How is it that this teaching, which is endless and immeasurable when thought out in the mind, could ever get taught in any finite amount of time? Now, he is quite insistent that though it is an endless knowledge, the Buddha was perfectly capable of teaching it. When he first taught the Abhidhamma, for example, he did so in three months' time, speaking continuously to his mother, in fact. Yet this knowledge will elude the capacity of one even as wise as Ananda, who, though he has great fortitude, intelligence, and learning, would not be able to learn in a thousand years the sermons preached by the Buddha in these three months. Moreover, the Abhidhamma was written down in seven books. So we have it, it's actually all translated. It was written down in seven books, but still it is endless. This suggests that as reliable as Ananda is in conveying the teachings, there is something about the Buddha's knowledge, the, the Dharma, that will always spill over any vessel, any amount of time, or any book that tries to contain it. So there has to be a productive tension between the infinite knowledge itself and the capacities and vessels ordinary humans have for conveying it, even though this tension is somehow erased with the Buddha and the Buddha alone teaches. Now, Buddhaghosa says further that those who study the Abhidhamma will experience endless joy, endless pleasure, and happiness when thinking it through. Now, this has not been at all obvious to modern scholars. These texts are difficult, full of lists and more lists, and have been accused of comprising some of the driest and most tedious texts in the whole of Buddhist thought. It's a reaction that has more or less consigned them to the remote and unfashionable backwaters of Buddhist studies. They are, at the very least, quite heavy-going scholasticism, and to see their genius takes a lot of intellectual work. But for Buddhaghosa, the Abhidhamma, he says, is beautiful and pleasurable. He says, it's like looking up into the night sky and seeing the stars and constellations, perceiving their infiniteness, but also the different arrangements of the stars and the forms in which the stars can be grouped. And this is a very specific image because what the Abhidhamma is doing is, is providing different groupings of the phenomenon, phenomena of experience and grouping and regrouping it. Um, so he sees that as a kind of infinite process, but also something that the, similar to observing the night sky. Another simile is that encountering the Abhidhamma is like being a person on a boat at sea contemplating the endlessness of the waters rippling out in all directions. But unlike the sea, which is in fact bordered on the bottom and edges by land, the Abhidhamma knowledge and method has no edge or no border. One who reflects in this way, Buddhaghosa says, will experience great joy. Now, a final set of examples about what he has to say about encountering the words of the sermons is that he describes the opening remarks that Ananda made to every sermon in rather lavish terms. Recall that every sermon starts with Ananda saying, thus have I heard, followed by a sort of, a sort of <coughs> stage setting of describing the context and audience. Once the Buddha was staying at such and such a place at such and such a time and was talking with these particular people. This opening part of the text was called the context or the origin of the sermon. Buddhaghosa says that when you hear this opener, your heart thrills and you enter into the sermon. It is a threshold into a place, and he gets uncharacteristically poetic here. He says that the opening context is like a beautiful gem-studded stepping stone into a lotus pool. It is like a sparkling staircase taking one into the veranda of a great mansion or a fabulous jeweled doorway into a palace. I won't go into all the ornate images and similes here, but he's deploying a deeply poetic sensibility to describe the context in which the Buddha's sermons took place and how the context takes us into the wisdom of the sermon itself. Now, what these contextual openers are, are narratives of very specific people and circumstances that the Buddha addressed. 
sermons are never decontextualized. They always have a particular audience. And the commentators delighted in elaborating the backstories of these people. These are the religious rivals the Buddha debated, the kings he converted, the householders, the ordinary people, the prostitutes, the wandering ascetics, and of course, the faithful disciples with whom the Buddha spoke on a day-by-day -day basis. Ananda's openers always gave a bit about these folks, and the commentators elaborate these stories further. Who was that rival ascetic he, he bested on this occasion, and what was his history? Why did this particular Brahmin ask the Buddha that question? How did the Buddha manage to convert the king of Magadha on this occasion? One of the later commentaries on this, on this says that the context give the Buddhist sermons authority, the stamp of having occurred since we know these particulars. Like a legal contract, he says, we take it as more authoritative if we know the original history and the names of the people present when it was signed. He seems to even actually disapprove of Buddhaghosa getting so poetic about this. He says it's much more like a legal contract. But Buddhaghosa goes further than this by emphasizing the pleasing and beautiful way that these contextual openers op allow one to enter a sermon. He finds a beautiful experience. But what was this beauty he saw in them? Now this has become more clear to me when I followed one of his commentaries on one of these contextualizing narratives. He elaborates to provide further details of the very specific backstories of the audience whereby we could see in practice how the Buddha's particular sermon or the content of the sermon spoke directly and singly to them. What he sees going on is that the Buddha's omniscient mind, which the claims about omniscience is that the Buddha knows other people's minds and he knows all of their previous histories from their, their previous lives. So the Buddha knew their particular circumstances of his audience so intimately that he was speaking directly to them in their singular circumstances. But for us to see this, this omniscient mind speaking uniquely and directly to these people, we have to know the actual specifics, the context, the circumstances with some detail. He says that the Buddha's words must always be simultaneously useful, beneficial, and true. Um, so the contextual opening, especially when the commentary expands it with it, its many details, opens up meaning in trying to show how that the words were useful, beneficial, and true to the person to whom they were spoken. Note that it is not enough that a given utterance simply be useful or true or beneficial. It has to be all three. To see how it is, we have to know how it works in the audience and their particular needs and conditions. This is resonant with the deeply psychological nature of all of this material. In many ways, in the, rec um, in the recognition of human diversity, not everyone who comes in front of a text will experience it in the same way, but will have be deeply conditioned by previous psychological experience or our histories. It becomes an exegetical exercise for Buddhaghosa to try to see how the particular teachings in a sermon were uniquely fitted to the particular circumstances of the original audience. It is seeing the fit that is the moment of pleasure in which meaning is extended and developed. Now at one point, Buddhaghosa wonders, who can begin to exhaustively explain the various purposes of these contexts? The elaboration of context can be huge. As you begin to understand the manifold histories, the backstories, the psychological complexities of an audience or of an encounter and its possibilities, the context and the way the Buddha's words addressed these contexts can get quite extensive. So this is a profoundly pragmatic and contextual theory of knowledge, and it is in principle open-ended especially when Buddhaghosa suggests that he was also ad addressing simultaneously future audiences who will have their own contexts. For him, this is an important place where we can glimpse the Buddha's omniscience at work. It's one thing to claim the Buddha's omniscience, and it's another thing to try to see where it's working. And it's notable that he sees this as a profoundly pleasurable and beautiful experience, and he wants the reader to see this. This is why he speaks so poetically about what these openers do in allowing us to enter a sermon. Entering a sermon is like approaching a lotus pond on bejeweled steps or ascending a glittering stairway to a lovely veranda to take in the night sky. Beauty is something found only in the concrete. We don't find beauty in the abstract ideas of gorgeous sunsets or human faces or pieces of music but we experience beauty in the concrete particularity of this sunset, this lovely face, or this stunning arrangement.
And Buddhaghosa's reading practices with the Buddhist sermons are about a deep and detailed exploration of the particular audience and the context to whom he originally spoke to see how his omniscient mind took in their singular needs and dispositions to speak directly to them, even as he was giving a sermon that did this to all parties to it, including people in the future. This disciplining the imagination to attend to the concrete details of this original face-to-face -face encounter for Buddhaghosa is the way we can potentially find it addressing us. As we find ourselves appreciating how the Buddha's words spoke to its original audience, it can speak to us. This reminds me of Ado's two contra contrary requirements. Try to understand something well in its own context so that it could potentially speak to one's own. So what I've tried to do here is to assemble a cluster of constructs Buddhaghosa suggests that can happen on encountering the Buddha's words. The sublime glimpse of the infinite, the thrill or pleasure in encountering the Buddha's words somehow present even after his death, the endless joy and happiness the endless teachings inspire, the singularity of being personally addressed, the beauty in, the, in, in meaning and form in the beginning, middle, and end. The only category I have for these experiences in English is the aesthetic. Buddhaghosa is consciously theorizing the reasons for continuing relevance of a text largely on the basis of its aesthetic impact. Now certainly there are many things Buddhaghosa is trying to do in all the commentaries. He's constructing a path of virtue and morality. He's describing mental and soteriological training. He's teaching doctrine, trying to inspire faith. And certainly any or all of these may be at play as well in any particular commentarial passage. But the steady return to the aesthetic is worth our attention too. What I see is that Buddhaghosa is not just engaging in an effort to read the texts in this way, enacting a commitment to beauty, but something more rare, which I don't find people talking about much, and that is narrating how he is, how he is, how he is doing it, describing the quest for beauty, beauty as a disciplinary practice. So if we turn back to my original question, what must I do to allow myself to be addressed by a text? I think Buddhaghosa's answer is going to entail the development of a certain sensibility. Of course, we may not be committed to the doctrinal positions here at all. Not all of us are prepared to accept the doctrinal claims of the Buddha's omniscience. And we may not personally find beauty or pleasure in encountering the Buddha's words. But still, I think he's naming something that might be useful for us and that he's trying to describe the aesthetic dimensions of intellectual rigor. What is it to be drawn to a system of ideas, to pursue the potential for beauty and pleasure it can make possible, which could be useful for us, committed to the humanistic ende endeavor and to the disciplines of interreligious understanding? His pointing to the mode of beauty as a mode through which we can be open to and perhaps find ourselves addressed by a text can become an important interpretive tool in our own humanistic study of texts and ancient ideas. Time for some questions. We have a question right up here, sir. Please. Um, so you you mentioned what do I have to do to be addressed by the text? What does one have to do to be addressed by the text? And you speak of a kind of historicist interpretation of the text. Um, are you talking? about looking at a group of words written a thousand years ago <coughs> and through applying a method trying to take them and make uh, concepts that were true in their own time have a kind of universality so that we might utilize them today. I probably would back away from the notion of universality, but I think what I suggested with Hedo's thought is something I am attracted to, that through the careful study of a text in its own, with our historicist tools, thinking about what it meant in its own context, something can happen where it speaks to us existentially. Um, it makes you think about being human in a different way. And Hedo is not quite real clear about how this happens. He sees it as a kind of spo interesting, spontaneous thing that ha can happen, in which you're addressed. It. What is it like for me as a human being when I have, when I'm confronted with that idea? And so it's a little different than 
just studying what, oh, this is what this meant to people back then, or this is why it, what it meant in this particular historical context. That one has to do that, right? You have to understand that well before it might then, it could speak to you about what it is to be human. So I don't think it's, I'm not necessarily interested in universals, but the, the idea is that ancient texts have things that could be of wide ranging significance for people in our own time. Is it possible that in doing this, the value that we derive would be contrary to the ancient father's intention? Yes, I think that's possible. Yeah. That's right. Yes? I have two questions. One is, could you tell us a little bit about the visual presentation of the text? That is, in the context of the scroll, Mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, particular style of Sanskrit, uh, or was it accompanied by uh, uh, some complementary icons, since mm -hmm. iconography was uh, a much stronger tradition hundreds of years beforehand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, uh, given that there was a very small body of uh, people who uh, uh, were literate, mm -hmm. uh, how was this con conveyed, in, uh, presumably verbally? Was this during uh, the typical morning and uh, evening prayers, or was this done in some other type of context? Okay, so to the first question, within the Pali tradition, we, I don't think we have any Pali manuscripts that survived from before about the 15th century. So what we have is, you know, they just didn't survive the climate very well. And there are some cases of very beautiful illustrated manuscripts where you do have, they're almost kind of works of art or works of beauty. Um, but you don't have a, a high tradition of calligraphy or anything like that, but you do have some we do have some very beautiful instances of illuminate. Of although although they have uh, discovered some earlier uh, scrolls in the caves of northern uh, that's right. uh, Nepal. That's right. So we have, you know, we found some interesting finds in Gandhara, in northern Af in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Nepal. So scholars, but those are in different languages, different Buddhist languages. Um, but so scholars are at their desks right now working on some of those. Um, the collection from the British Library for, would be one example that they're doing up in. Um, Seattle. So we're learning, and those are much older manuscripts um, that reveal these Buddhist cultures from um, Afghanistan and these other places. Um, and so then your second question, remind me, is the second question? In terms of how was this uh, communicated oh. uh, uh, among the, uh, uh, the uh, Buddhist Muslim right. scholars? Right. So, um, you know, in terms of um, you know, I don't think we have a terribly good understanding of how this worked, but um, you know, for I think a lot of it was an oral tradition, uh, at least for the first several centuries, of course, after the Buddha died. Um, and then at one point they were using manuscripts, um, but it was probably only, you know, the real work on text was only open to a monastic, a small monastic elite um, who would have been studying this. You, again, a commentary would only be, you know, a, a text would only be taught with, in the presence of a teacher who would have also providing a commentary on it so that it would always have that context at least. And so I think that's one of the things Buddha Ghost is interested in is, you know, these texts are always situated and just trying to think through what are the different commentaries, what are those different contexts in which a text is being situated, including the commentarial one. Um, but probably largely through an oral, an oral or a manuscript would be used, but then most of the conversation about it would be an oral one. Yes. Um, related to that, um, some of us who come from a Judaic Christian tradition, you know, understand chapters of you know the Pentateuch. Mm -hmm. So, and then they're but they're like these nuggets and sentences. Mm -hmm. So, what would be kind of the form again that's mm -hmm. communicating the message? And can you give an example? So, when you tell us to attend to the beauty and form and right. content. So can you provide us with some quote, uh, some sense that calls us to do that so that okay. we get a sense of what the context is suggesting to us in terms of past and present? Right. So it's hard. It's hard. This is one of the challenges of this particular paper is to show this without having you guys all have a miniature poly lesson or something like that. But, um, you know, so one of the 
things, one of the kind of hermeneutical devices that uh, these commentators were using would be something that scholars for a long time were very dismissive of because they are, they're offering their own etymological, um, which are not you know, linguistic as we understand it, but they would offer, they would break a, a word apart, literally a word. And so, for example, the word sutta, um, that word su, the first part of that word means good. Right, and so a sutta, and then they would break the ta apart, and they would so they would come up with a, you know tons of different definitions. Good this, and then we could have lots of different possibilities with what that ta would have meant, and be moving um, all around with you know for us it's just, for scholars, Western scholars when they first got a hold of this were just saying they, they were just sloppy linguistically. They know those words didn't come from that root, um, but that they would be using that as a way of generating meaning and possibility. And so I think actually now that we've been learning how to read those more. We're seeing, oh, okay, this is a way that they're pulling in meaning from a range of different possibilities and trying to generate it. Um, does that help a little bit? You want more of a concrete example? I think it would help the audience. Okay, let me give let me give that a little bit of thought about what we could. Um, okay, I'll take up the word abhidharma, abhidhamma, right? So this is this particular um, genre of texts. Um, and one of the things Buddhaghosa does with it is he says, so what, is the, what does Dhamma mean? And so he's going to have a lot of definitions of what the Dhamma means, which is the Buddha's teaching, um, and uh, cover a whole range of those. And then he takes up the prefix abhi. And he says, first it could mean excel, which is one of the things it could mean. So it's something that excels the Dhamma, and that sends him into a kind of riff on what would it mean to have the, the Dharma itself excelled by something else, right? And so he spins that out. The word abhi can also mean growth. So he works out what does it mean for the Dharma to grow and expand in the way that he's interested in. Um, he refers to other branches of Pali thought um, to talk about something called, there's a genre of text called the monastic text called the Vinaya. And sometimes there's a kind of second order reflection on the Vinaya called Abhi Vinaya. So he says this is a kind of second order reflection on the Dharma that's equivalent to Abhi Vinaya or Abhi Chitta, which is reflection on thought that we see in the kind of suttas. So he's, that gives you a little example, that, one that just comes to mind of how he's trying to just see, well, we break a word apart into its prefix and its main word. What do those different suggestions, what possibilities do those different suggestions make? it possible to think about what this even is. Does that help a little bit? Yes. So my question is about aesthetics. Yeah. Um, the general question is, is beauty objective and universal, or is it entirely subjective in particular? Right. And specifically, you say we should attend to the beauty in form, beauty in form and content. But can we modern readers appreciate the beauty that Cody saw, uh, do we have access to what he saw as beautiful, or can we only see what we ourselves see as beautiful? It connects to the right. previous questioners. Coming from a Judeo-Christian background, we, we understand the Psalms, we know the parables of Jesus, right. and we see those kinds of texts as beautiful, mm -hmm. and yet I think the kinds of texts that you're describing are very different, and can we somehow get into beauty of, of those texts as well. Right. So, I, I mean, I think the price of admission is high. You have to learn these languages. You have to do, you know, so all the kinds of stuff. You have to learn philology and history and, and access to these languages and the texts, you know, just that, just to get in the door, right? But I do think, I definitely think Buddhaghosa thought that this would be beautiful to people in the future. He thought it was beautiful in his day, and he thought it was just as beautiful in his day as it was in Anat's day when it was first spoken. So he thought, for Buddhaghosa, you know, he thought this was beautiful. You just have to learn how to get access to it. And then I'll just speak for myself. You know, this is what I spend my time doing, right, is reading these texts. And I do think the closer I read, the more I read, the more I see why this is beautiful and pleasurable. So I don't know if it's, you know, you know I just know that there is, that's what I'm interested in, trying to figure out what did he think about how that could happen? Because this is a really different context and a really different time and place from his. And so when it does seem to happen, right, in which I say, oh, I see what he means, and I can see the pleasure in it, right, or when I'm reading a group of, with other people and we all see it, then that's what I'm interested in. How does that happen? Because, as you say, maybe it shouldn't, but it does.
right? And so that's, you know, but again, I don't think it's something, it's not like reading, you know, a tweet. It's not like reading the newspaper. <laughs> you know, it, it's like it takes this, this discipline. But to me, the argument, I'm just interested, this isn't just something that, you know, for me, it's not enough. These are just things that are part of the past, and we should study them because they belong to another time and place. I think it's, that maybe they would speak to us. And often they do. And so when, when they do, and when they make us feel that this is beautiful and this is pleasurable, I want to know why and how that, that's happening. So I guess one way to understand my paper is just to try, I'm trying to figure out, well, what does Buddhaghosa say about that? Because I want to know what that means. And I, and, and I think, too, for him, it's a deeply intellectual thing. Um, and, and so that was the other thing I was trying to get at, well, what is it that, why is this kind of intellectual practice fun, right? <laughs> at least to some of us? Is, it, is that threshold really any uh, higher than, uh, if you will, the Christian threshold? I mean, we are inculcated from uh, soon after when we're two years old, we, we are read stories uh, about about Jesus and 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 we celebrate it all the time and certainly in a Buddhist environment they live it every day and those the stories go on and uh, uh, going to the Buddhist temples is, is an everyday event so what's the difference in the tr threshold uh, for Buddhism than a fair Theravada Buddhism than it is uh, for us in Christianity. Okay, so probably no doubt. I mean, uh, so this is why I frame this in terms of text from the ancient past, right? It's not the same as just imbibing your cultural narratives. I think sitting down and reading a difficult scholastic text from the ancient past is equally difficult in the ancient you know, languages of the Near East as they are. You know, so I, that's why I'm not trying to say this is something unique to Buddhism. Um, the threshold is hard. It's, it's hard to read ancient texts. One last question, the gentleman up there. Uh, yes, uh, it was a very interesting talk. Thank you. The question I had had to do with um, the extent to which this particular commentator would have uh, welcomed a, an interpretation of his work, uh, I think in the way you're doing it, which is uh, detached from the soteriological purpose of all this. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, that's really hard to say. The, the only place I have to, I mean, he, he's very much pitching this within a whole larger framework of which he wouldn't have imagined someone like me. Um, however, this little nugget of the story about him that the tradition has recorded about him, that he was somebody who was a Brahmin. He was not a part of Buddhism at all. And he wandered around India, was obviously recognized. And this is something of a trope, but it's still something that tradition remembered about him. And he wandered around India just interested in debating people. And then he encounters the Abhidhamma, and he has no interest in being a Buddha, Buddhist monk, right? And yet he shaves his head and adopts a celibate lifestyle, becomes a monk, so he could learn this intellectual system. So that, what that tells me, at least the tradition thought, you, you could be interested in this purely intellectually. Which that in and of itself, and there's something about that that just rings true when I read him, that he's just, he's in it for the intellectual rewards of it. To, to, to some considerable degree. Well, thank you for the beauty of tonight.